we have our Council General from India, Honorable Dr. Swati Kulkarni. Swati ji, good morning to you. Good morning. Namaskar. Namaskar. How are you, ma'am? Yes, I am fine. Thank you, Aniji. Thanks for inviting. Good morning, Mr. John McIntyre and everybody. Good to see you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, let me briefly introduce you to the for the audience. Uh, Dr. Swati Kulkarni is our Council General of India here in the Consulate of India. She is a career diplomat who holds MBBS degree from the prestigious government medical college Nagpur in India. She joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1995. Prior to her appointment as Council General, uh, Consulate of India, Atlanta, she served as Regional Passport Officer, officer in Mumbai, uh, Maharashtra. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, uh, Council General uh, was also uh, in uh, Council General in CGI Cape Town, South Africa from 2012 to 2014 and Deputy Head Mission in Muscat, Oman from 2008 to 2012. Dr. Kulkarni's previous overseas assignments were first secretary in High Commission of India, London, where she successfully worked as nodal officer for preventing discrimination for Indian medical graduates after implementation of new UK immigration rules first secretary in the High Commission of India, Port Louis, Mauritius, and as third secretary in Embassy of India, Spain. At headquarters, Dr. Kulkarni worked as an additional private secretary to the External Affairs Minister and later deputed as Regional Passport Officer, Pune. As Under Secretary, looking after Austria, Cyprus, Greece, Slovenia, Switzerland, and Holy See, Malta, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain between 2003 to 2005. Dr. Kulkarni is married to Mr. Vijay Jayant Kulkarni, who is an ex-merchant mariner by profession and has two, they have two daughters. Her interests include study of developmental issues, swimming and tennis. Dr. Kulkarni, welcome to UIBS and Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. Thank you, Aniji. You have given a detailed uh, overview of myself. Thanks for your kind and generous words. Uh, my warm greetings to all participants, all dignitaries from UIBS. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm told it's the 12th UIBS forum. It's a 27 Georgia Tech Business Forum. Yes, so yes, congratulations yes. for achieving these milestones. And I understand you are also doing for the first time Global US Forum. So congratulations for setting new trend. Thank okay. you. So I'm... Uh, uh, you know, confident that such forums will uh, help in productive and useful discussions and they will help in giving deep insights as far as possible opportunities or way ahead is concerned. India and US, both the countries enjoy a very strategic partnership and this partnership is of global significance. It's multifaceted, it's multidimensional and it continues to strengthen across diverse sectors. So it touches every aspect of human endeavor from the depths of the sea to the vastness of ocean. And why we have such a good relationship? Both the countries, you know that they are vibrant democracies, they are market economies and pluralistic societies. Moreover, there is a strong bipartisan support and strong, strong public support for this beautiful relationship. The trade and investment and the commercial linkages, they are rapidly transforming this uh, relationship. And consistently we have seen that there is double digit growth year on year. The bilateral trade pre-COVID era we have seen was $150 billion. And this year we know that it will bounce back beyond this particular landmark. As far as Southeast USA is concerned, where I am based in Atlanta, I am dealing with six states and two territories and the overall bilateral merchandise trade between India and Southeast USA is, was $12.5 in 2019 and 2020 it was $10.8 million. So there was a 12% dip. But this year we know that it will bounce back and we can see those figures in the next few months. South Carolina is the only state which has maintained the bilateral trade figures which they had in 2019, also in 2020, and that was at $1.7 billion. The reason might be that South Carolina established a trade office in India way back in 2015. So in this region, we have 160 companies, all including small, medium, 
and we have about 54 manufacturing companies and rest are in services sectors so in atlanta i can see many it people coming from india so these companies they have invested 13.5 billion dollars in this particular southeast part of the usa and they have helped in creating 12000 plus jobs 6000 in manufacturing and 6000 in services sectors apart from this we have very enterprising vibrant diaspora it's 450000 people who are here and they have invested in various sectors like realty hospitality healthcare we have very good indian american doctors we have people in hotel motel industry and those who are in startup and of course in it sector and other services areas so i know that your forum is very much focusing on leveraging opportunities in digitized economy and advanced manufacturing so let me tell you what india is achieving in these various sectors you must have seen that you know during last few years india has assured in many many policy initiatives like make in india skill india digital india and during covid my government my leadership thought that we have to create an opportunity out of this crisis so there was focus on self reliant india which is self generating and self sustaining so these initiatives have given a mantra of minimum government maximum governance so the digital space in india is very very powerful the startup culture is thriving in a good positive direction you can see that in india with a one sixth of humanity 1.1 billion people have mobile phones 500 million half of the population almost have smartphones 800 million people are using internet over and above all government has given a biometric identity to everybody which we call aadhar and more than 80% people have bank account so this has really created a profound effect on life of every indian and this in turn has helped us in transforming governance banking insurance and everything which government is providing like direct benefit transfers the startup culture is thriving in three metros like delhi mumbai and bangalore and currently we have 35000 plus startups and they have helped in creating 90000 billion dollars so we expect that in 2 3 years next 2 3 years we will see 1 million you know startups which will create 1 trillion to indian economy and they are there in various sectors like we have science and technology they are creating cost effective frugal solutions in science and technology like uh, the uh, even the medicine healthcare they are in telemedicine online education you name it and they are there even in drones so we have 100 unicorns then our government has also focused on skill india and it the mantra is skilling skilling and skilling so we have a new education policy which is very ambitious very revolutionary and it will again help in having more skilling to our population government is also focusing on msmes advanced manufacturing and towards this government has introduced production linked incentive scheme scheme what we call plis scheme so it is in various sectors like mobile telephony textiles electric vehicle segment and this will help you know consumers at the end of it because government is giving those industries very many incentives tax incentives land acquisition incentives and the import export duty rebates and things like that so that will give consumers you know more benefit because the costs will be less i know that india's you also have must have seen that india's growth story is really you know positive and the upward it's on upward trajectory so once india grows it will have more requirements and us as a country is best place to meet these demands because us has cutting edge technology and india has skilled manpower us has also invested in india's developmental priorities like smart cities then ports aviation industries mm. infrastructure so that is also helping us indian businesses are doing and growing in us 
and vice versa many us conglomerates the big ones are already in india and above all the human link is very enduring we have indians the indian students are 200000 and many indians have gone back to india and they have they are participants of india's growth story for example bharat biotech that's a shining example and those who have stayed in india like aniji and others they are also part of us fabric the us is recognizing their merit their hard work so all in all this vibrant bridge of innovation and enterprise is existing between the two countries so i take this opportunity to invite the us businesses to come to india and invest more and more and vice versa i also take this opportunity to commend the efforts of uibs team to have this forum where many people will participate interact and there will be cross fertilization of ideas so let us strive to make this friendly this mutually beneficial relationship more and more result oriented jai hind thank you thank you council jan kulkarni uh, i would like to ask you uh, as the host for this program for last 12 years i have seen personally uh, the tremendous growth which has taken place between the relations of uh, us and india and uh, our uh, our leaders have recently met also uh, what are your uh, thoughts about two things number one uh, what role india is likely to play in the middle east and secondly in terms of climate change aniji always asks me uh, very difficult questions right <laughs> no. see india you have seen is very interested in having friendly relationship with all the countries including middle east i wo- i was uh, there in oman as a deputy head of mission i have seen how close and how cordial and how friendly the relationship india enjoyed with oman and of course with other middle east countries we always say that india has you know uh, india has neighbors and then there is a concentric circle so beyond neighbors we have extended neighborhood and that's what we call middle east so middle east is very important for us because there are it's a lot of indian diaspora also blue skilled workers are working there apart from that oil oil and uh, other energy related uh, issues where india is uh, having those uh, sort of uh, you know uh, trade and investment linkages with middle east so middle east is very important dubai is emerging as a important uh, uh, you know port of call where the trade investment commercial linkages are thriving so that's uh, very good as far as climate change is concerned you have seen that how india has taken a lead as far as international solar alliance is concerned so the uh, and recently us also joined it so many countries are joining this uh, particular initiative which india has spearheaded even at cop 26 india has uh, told what exactly it has the you know the uh, future timelines where india will contribute to this important climate change security and initiative even at domestic front india has committed itself for the solar energy for the wind energy our targets are always uh, we are uh, you know achieving them before time so the solar energy we have seen we have 70 uh, gigawatts wind energy also we have 30 plus gigawatts so our aim is to achieve 450 gigawatts before 2030 then we also have uh, energy emissions as well as vehicles are concerned we are putting those uh, you know climate uh, where we are using cng for uh, buses and things like that and for the vehicles also so they don't give those fumes and uh, you know pollute the air then we are also using led lamps the solar lamps they are also very popular in rural areas so very many things on multiple uh, fronts so government is focusing on this multi pronged approach where the climate you know the climate change uh, things we contribute as a country where we also keep our developmental priorities on track thank you ma'am really appreciate it uh it is always an honor to have you and get your support uh, to grow the us india relationships and uh, we thank you for your time and ambassador blaze has also joined us so please stay with us for some time yes. till the end of the session thank, thank you. you thank you again thank you everybody thank you so much thank you uh, good morning ambassador blaze
How are you? Good morning, Annie. Well, uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, to say a few words. You are uh, joining us for the second or third time for our programs and uh, welcome back to Atlanta and thank you for being with us this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, I really think that you're addressing critical topics. So, uh, and some that, of course, Canada is playing a big role in. And so I'm happy to be here and to, uh, to join in the conversation. Wonderful. Please uh, uh, let us know your thoughts about the program and how U.S., Canada and India are working on the areas which we are covering in our su summit today. So I... Um, I thought that I would address this morning really briefly some of the opportunities and challenges, obviously, that we are facing with the, tra uh, the transition to the dig digital economy that has only accelerated, you know, accelerated because of the pandemic. Sure. And I, uh, I thought I'd address a few aspects of, of, of that transition, which is both you know, domestic and it is global. And my time at the UN, I really learned about the disparities that we, uh, we're facing. As we move to the digital economy, we have to make sure that we leave no one behind. If we're gonna meet the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals at the, at the global level, um, the digital path is absolutely, you know, absolutely essential. It can, uh, but it will only work if uh, we make sure, like the vaccine really, that uh, everyone has access to the, those opportunities. And that really, I think from my perspective, uh, is driven by broadband access. I mean, we've all seen 40% of Canadians have moved to, um, to online work exclusively during the pandemic. Uh, and we have, uh, certainly in Canada, we have realized that in order to be totally part of Canadian society, you must have access. And it's not just for work, it's also for personal reasons, shopping, and I've had, you know, live a normal life. So it's almost becoming a, a, uh, a citizenship right. I almost want to say a human right nowadays to have access, as much as we used to think about clean water before, access to clean water, we now have to think about access to broadband services so that everyone can partake in what is really has become a digital economy. Um, and I wanted to maybe um, kick off um, and talk a little bit about some of the, the, those challenges. We know that as, as the economy is, is transitioning to a more digital platform um, and that jobs are shifting and the landscape is changing. Unfortunately, those that were worst off before, either the pandemic or the digital revolution, are also uh, being, at the moment, disproportionately affected by those rapid changes. I'm talking here about women, uh, about uh, poor uh, groups, and uh, racialized communities. And, and Canada is no exception to this. Let's talk a little bit about coming back to the broadband access. In Canada, you know, obviously the private sector is going to make sure and is going to have no problem providing broadband, broadband access to cities like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and so on and so forth. However, our rural communities, because Canada is an enormous country like India um, in terms of geographic uh, span, we have communities that are very remote and we cannot unfortunately count on the private sector to make sure that there's access for in particular indigenous communities uh, in Canada. And they are so far do not have the same access to broadband internet as city dwellers. So these are challenges that governments are facing moving forward as we, uh, as we make sure that everybody can join in to, uh, to, uh, to this, what should be a very positive um, uh, development. Now, I also want to talk about other challenges that lie ahead with this digital transformation. And that's where the international piece comes, comes together as well. It's going to become very difficult, I think, to track productivity internationally, because as you move to the cloud, it's much more difficult to capture measurements compared to tr traditional goods, for example. It's going to be more difficult to also understand um, transfers between uh, countries, because as you deal on the cloud, then all of a sudden you no longer are, are, are um, under the purview of any set government. So it's going to really challenge um, 
all of our governments internationally to work in a multilateral um, approach to uh, address some of those challenges to make sure that we um, we are harnessing the potential of this uh, of this revolution. So I'll stop there uh, for now and uh, happy to take some questions and continue to engage. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Canada has always been a leader uh, in multilateral, uh, responding to multilateral challenges. Uh, given the uh, recent uh, summit in Glasgow, uh, what is Can Canada's view regarding climate change and uh, the hopes for meeting some of the targets in 2030? And can digitalization be uh, a force in propelling the, the necessary progress towards the targets of 2030? Canada has long held the view that we uh, greening our economy was an opportunity, not something to look at uh, in a negative lens. We uh, are leading the world in areas related to uh, green growth. And we are um, offering the world a great deal of innovation in, in the area of, of, uh, of uh, uh, green energy. We have had a province of Ontario that has transformed its electricity um, and energy sector uh, 10 years ago, well ahead of everyone else, through much more sustainable sources of energy. Of course, Canada is very, very um, fortunate to have uh, el cheap <laughs> electric uh, hydropower, and that is really giving us a, 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 head, a, a sort of an advantage. But that being said, we have made commitment in Glasgow that we will phase out uh, um, uh, the sectors that, that are really having a negative impact. And, that, and we will continue to work uh, with our international partners and making sure that we, uh, we uh, meet our own targets. It's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging um, and it's an ambitious plan, but one that we're committed to. And I do believe that uh, the, the opportunities that the digital economy offer are part of that equation. Is solar energy part of the picture for Canada? Solar energy, wind power is also uh, very much part of the mix. It depends, you know, we have a very diverse geographic, um, uh, you know, country, but uh, we, uh, we, we have applied as in the past, we have used nuclear power um, and uh, we are looking at what makes sense depending on the provinces. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Consul General Kulkani. Uh, you talked about uh, the collaboration in innovation between uh, North America and, uh, and India. I wonder if you could expand on that. Are there pending treaties or uh, pending agreements regarding more collaboration in R&D in various sectors? Um, Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. See, what in between India and US, uh, we have science and technology agreement. So we have renewed it recently. Then there are 200 plus NIH uh, supported projects that are going between India and uh, USA. So that has created a huge, huge ecosystem of knowledge network. I'll give you one example, rather two, in fact. One is rotavirus between uh, India and USA. We in Delhi, we have, uh, you know, we have got a vaccine for rotavirus, which uh, causes diarrhea and all that sort of thing. So when we have got that vaccine, we have even exported to other countries, the third countries like Africa. And uh, it's very cost effective vaccine, which is very helpful to many countries. That's one. Then the second uh, thing, uh, um, of course, in vaccine space, we are also collaborating on other vaccines like malaria, influenza, and now also the COVID vaccine. The other example which I wanted to give is like Gilead, where Gilead company, it entered in India during COVID. And uh, they, they, uh, have a, they made a deal with some seven, eight Indian companies where the prices, see, for the remdesivir, the prices dropped because in India, it's very, very cost effective. You can do it in a frugal way and the R&D ecosystem also is a very, very strong. 
so they uh, the remdesivir only cost uh, 72 dollars in india if you take the entire treatment of 6 uh, days or something it will only cost 430 dollars which will be the otherwise cost for one day in us so the, these are various programs and initiatives as far as healthcare is concerned then the, then there is a bi, uh, sanford biodesign program between india and sanford university that has also helped in creating unicorns in india they have helped in creating at least uh, five plus unicorns so in innovation also and in frugal innovations also we are really doing well with this huge knowledge network that exists between india and usa thank you i i am wondering if there is time for one more questions from uh, ambassador blay uh, i w- just your quick assessment of the uh, canada us trade and investment relations which has always been of course uh, stri- uh, thriving uh, over the years uh, but any issues you see uh, as uh, popping up on the horizon line yes thank you so much for that question i really appreciate it because it's very uh, timely actually because as tomorrow our prime minister will be meeting with president biden and uh, their mexican counterpart for the first summit of the what we call the three amigos um and one of the topic that will first summit in many many years one of the topic that will come up uh that will uh, that the prime minister will raise is the importance of really reinvigorating this partnership we renegotiated usmca um previously nafta for a very good reason it's because we from a manufacturing and economic perspective we are stronger together when we work together um and uh recently canada has been concerned with some of the policies that are being considered um by washington related to buy america for example increasing the percentage of uh domestic components and and their manufacturing uh, and the another example is the the talk of uh ev tax credit that is again would favor uh, american uh component um uh parts of of electric vehicles the problem with that is we now have a very positive uh mutually beneficial integrated economy and when you bring in these protectionist measures you not only uh risk going against uh your commitments your bilateral or uh multilateral commitments you also hurt your manufacturing competitiveness so we will spend quite a bit of time um probably uh, over the next uh, weeks and months to continue to advocate for the importance of a level playing field uh between certainly between our three countries as we have seen how much it has fueled so much growth over the past three decades and we need to preserve that especially moving forward coming out of the covid 19 pandemic thank you very much uh yes that that is a, an upper most issue and we'll be watching very carefully uh for reports coming out of that meeting great Well uh, thank you ambassador blaze thank you dr kulkarni we really appreciate your participation and support this morning uh, we we have tried to uh, put together a very strong program addressing lots of global issues and hope to get your continued support for our future events thank you thank you so so very much thank you for joining us thank appreciate you. your presence thank, thank you. you thank you so much